Welcome to the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. Our program is featuring Dan Vermilia, who is a National Park Service Ranger. Dan currently works at the Eisenhower National Historic Site, where he is able to exercise his passion for World War II history as part of his work. Dan has been a ranger also at the Antietam National Battlefield, the Monocacy National Battlefield, and the Gettysburg National Military Park. Tonight, Dan is going to feature the Adams County World War II veterans who were okay. killed during their service. So I'm going to turn the program over to Ranger Dan Vermilia. Dan, you're on. Thank you, Antigone, and thank you to the Adams County Historical Society for hosting uh, this program this evening. It is very nice to be with you all uh, here for our program. Um, as, as we have here a, a great uh, opportunity to discuss some very important stories about Adams County, Pennsylvania, and this county's involvement in World War II. It's, it's such a historic county, one of the most historic counties in America with layers of history overlapping here. And I think uh, Dwight David Eisenhower and Mamie Eisenhower choosing Adams County to be the location of their only home they would ever own together uh, is obviously hugely significant. And this being the location of the Eisenhower's home, uh, you know, it does make us, I think, wonder sometimes what is a home? You know, neither Ike nor Mamie were from Gettysburg or Adams County originally, but they did call this area home. And I think a home can be many different things. And uh, here in the story of, of Dwight David Eisenhower here, uh, let's just consider some of the various places he did call home throughout his life. And as we reflect on the meaning of what a home is and what a home can be, here we see Ike and Mamie standing out in back of their, their Gettysburg farm. So a house or a home can be a place where we're born. Uh, for Dwight Eisenhower, that would be Denison, Texas, pictured here as his birthplace where he was born in 1890. A home can also be a place where we grew up. For Dwight Eisenhower, that is this, his boyhood home in Abilene, Kansas. A home could be a place where we went to school and spent a part of our lives that was formative years. For Dwight Eisenhower, that is West Point, where he went to the United States Mil Military Academy and graduated as part of the class of 1915. Home could be a place where we met that special someone. Uh, for Dwight Eisenhower, that would be Fort Sam Houston in Texas. This is a, a photograph from Fort Sam Houston where Eisenhower was posted several times uh, during his career, but it was there where he met Mamie Dowd in the fall of 1915, just a few months after he had left West Point. A home could be a place where we work. Uh, for myself, I'm not from Adams County originally, but it's where I live. It's where I work here at the Eisenhower National Historic Site, so it's home in that sense. And Dwight and Mamie called many different places home because they worked in many different places, one of them being the White House. So there are many different things that make a place home. Uh, the image that you're seeing on the screen here is the Eisenhower Toile. It was uh, designed by Elizabeth Draper in the mid-1950s, and it has representations of various places where the Eisenhowers lived or worked and important symbols from their lives together. And our homes and all these places, they tend to shape us and who we are and who we become. And Dwight Eisenhower really understood the importance of home because he had so many of them through his life as we just saw here. And he not only understood the importance of home, but he understood the importance of a homecoming. For Dwight Eisenhower, he got a chance to have a glorious homecoming in June of 1945 as the victorious Supreme Allied Commander from Europe in World War II when he came to Abilene for a hero's welcome. He gave remarks that day saying, the proudest thing I can claim is that I am from Abilene. And he was so particularly aware and grateful for this opportunity for a homecoming because Eisenhower had just overseen so much combat and fighting during the Second World War where millions did not get the chance to go home. Hundreds of thousands of Americans did not get the chance to go home and have a homecoming. He was acutely aware of that because when he spoke and had this homecoming in Abilene, it was June 22nd of 1945. And just 10 days earlier, he was honored in London at uh, 
and gave a, a, an address known as his Guildhall Address in London on June 12th of 1945. Uh, you can see here in this photograph, he's being uh, receiving a Distinguished Service Medal from President Truman June 18th of 1945. But in Ike's Guildhall Address, this is what he had to say. Humility must always be the portion of any man who received a claim earned in the blood of his followers and the sacrifices of his friends. Conceivably, a commander may have been professionally superior. He may have given everything of his heart and mind to meet the spiritual and physical needs of his comrades. He may have written a chapter that will glow forever in the pages of military history. Still, even such a man, if he existed, would sadly face the fact that his honors cannot hide in his memories the crosses marking the resting places of the dead. They cannot soothe the anguish of the widow or the orphan whose father, whose husband or whose father will not return. Eisenhower understood the importance of home. He understood the importance of a homecoming. He is a general who commanded hundreds of thousands, millions during the Second World War, and thousands of those were buried all around the world, those who had fallen under his command. In American cemeteries and faraway places like Tunisia in North Africa, Sicily in the Mediterranean, Normandy in France, Belgium, for the Battle of the Bulge, pictured here with the Henri Chapelle U.S. Military Cemetery. And yes, fallen soldiers who fought under Ike's command who were buried in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the same town where Dwight and Mamie would one day have their only home they would ever own. And our program tonight is about what home means. And we're going to look at that through the lens of fallen soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines from Adams County, Pennsylvania, who gave the ultimate sacrifice in the Second World War and who were ultimately buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery in their home county. Adams County and Gettysburg were impacted by World War II in many ways. There was a German POW camp here in Gettysburg during the war. There was a Camp Sharp a, a Psychological Warfare Training Center. There were scrap metal drives, uh, staff rides of the Gettysburg battlefield, but the number one way Adams County and Gettysburg were impacted by the Second World War was that it sent, Adams County and Gettysburg sent its native sons and daughters to go fight in that conflict. It was impacted by the war just like every other county in the United States was. And tonight, the individuals we're gonna be meeting called Adams County home in many different ways. Some of them were born here. Some of them moved here at one point and spent a formative period of their lives here. Some of them married individuals who were from Adams County. Some of them worked here. Some of them went to school here. They all called this place home in life. And ultimately, they would all call this place home by having their final resting place be in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Just from a numerical perspective, what did Adams County look like in the World Wars? In World War I, a uh, population of just over 34,000, according to the 1920 census. <laughs> 100, uh, excuse me, 1,074 1, served in uniform, 53 were killed or died in, in service. In World War II, population in 1940 was 39,435. Of those 6,671 served in uniform and 122 were killed or died during service. We're gonna meet some of those individuals here in our program. And we might ask, how is it that individuals who are killed in these faraway places are ultimately buried here in Gettysburg National Cemetery? In the years after the Second World War, the United States embarked upon really an unprecedented repatriation process for its fallen. I say unprecedented, not because other countries have not had burial grounds for their fallen. I say unprecedented, not because the United States had never brought it's fallen home and had uh, brought thousands of fallen service members home after the First World War. But I say unprecedented because of the scale. Of over 280,000 identified American dead across the world after World War II, the United States government asked all their families what they wanted for their loved ones' remains. 171,000 families chose to have their loved ones brought home to the United States. At the cost of $564.50 per body, the United States government honored that wish. It's remarkable. It is, in the words of Pulitzer Prize winning author Rick Atkinson, or it was, an unprecedented repatriation that only an affluent, victorious nation could afford. 
And it brings to mind in my uh, my studies a quote from the board of the Antietam National Cemetery in 1869, which is one of the striking indications of civilization and refinement among a people is the tenderness and care manifested by them towards their dead. Surely a country that would bring home its fallen service members in this fashion uh, would uh, be a, a, a plus in its column, a, a indicator of, of the character and caliber of that country. So what about Gettysburg National Cemetery? Well, it was one of the eligible national cemeteries in the United States to receive these fallen soldiers. Some were buried in private cemeteries, some families chose national cemeteries. Gettysburg National Cemetery was one of two cemeteries in the state of Pennsylvania accepting the repatriation of fallen World War II service members. Uh, the initial questionnaires that went out had such a high response rate that it was actually capped at no more than 600 who could be buried here in Gettysburg as they projected thousands of new graves here that would forever change the historic nature of Gettysburg National Cemetery. And at the time, uh, the National Park Service noted, according to the Gettysburg Times, that it was because of Gettysburg's importance as a national shrine that so many next of kin of World War II bed have requested burial here. And I would argue that the presence of these fallen World War II service members uh, only adds to that status as a national shrine for Gettysburg National Cemetery, which with ultimately 590 fallen World War II service members buried there, is the largest World War II burial ground in the state of Pennsylvania. And I think there's something very fitting and poetic about that, especially considering Eisenhower ultimately calling Gettysburg his home. So this evening, we're gonna meet some of those 590 fallen World War II service members. Uh, this image is from the Gettysburg Times in May of 1945, Memorial Day of 1945, listing names of fallen service members from Adams County during the Second World War. And we're gonna break down uh, the individuals we're gonna meet tonight into three categories, stateside deaths, deaths from the Pacific Theater and deaths from the European Theater of Operations. Uh, the first two individuals we will meet are both individuals who are from Adams County who died in stateside training accidents during the Second World War. First up is Dorsey Decker. Now, Dorsey was not born in Adams County. He was born in Blair County, but he moved to Adams County as a young man. Uh, he was born January 30th of 1919. We know that he was here by the 1930s because the Gettysburg Times included notices of Dorsey looking for work in the area. He had moved here with his mother. Dorsey was five foot seven inches tall, 158 pounds, had blue eyes, brown hair, and a light complexion. And he joined the United States Army in 1942. He became a member of the 450th Specialized Pilot Training Squadron. As part of that, he served as a mechanic. He served on various flights. His nickname in his squadron was Buddy. And it was in early 1944 when he was uh, stationed as a mechanic at Hendricks Field in Florida, he was killed in a plane crash when a bomber he was flying on landed at Fort Worth, Texas, January 13th of 1944. It was a, a training flight and all aboard were killed. Five days later, Dorsey Decker arrived here back home in Gettysburg. A Sergeant Gilbert Helt from his unit in Florida accompanied him home and Sergeant Helt noted of Dorsey, quote, he was a fine soldier, a mighty good engineer, specialist, and an enthusiastic member of the Air Forces. Dorsey was interred here in Gettysburg, January 21st of 1944. Ultimately, tragedy would strike his family again later in the war when his brother Harold Decker was killed in action on Christmas Day, 1944, in Germany. Olivia, their mother, had lost two sons, and according to the Gettysburg Times, quote, this is the first instance of known record that an Adams County mother has lost two sons in this war. Harold Kinsey, he went to Gettysburg High School. He wasn't born here, but his family moved here in 1938 when his dad got a job as the superintendent of the Metropolitan Edison Electric Company. They lived in the town of Gettysburg. Harold, again, went to Gettysburg High School, very active in the high school, participated in, in many plays and musical theater productions. And young Harold was six foot four inches tall. He was into athletics. 
and he played basketball and he excelled. He was very active. You look through the Gettysburg Times and the Gettysburg High School yearbooks of the early 1940s, you'll find Harold Kinsey's name all over the place. He was a member of the Christ Lutheran Church on Chambersburg Street. He was a local Boy Scout. And after he graduated high school 80 years ago in 1942, he went to York, Pennsylvania for a while to take courses in a government defense school. He registered for selective service June 30th of 1942. Again, he was six foot four, weighed 195 pounds had blue eyes, brown hair, and a light complexion. He ultimately enlisted December of 1942, and he was called into active duty February of 1943. Harold spent many months training here stateside in the United States. Ultimately, he was commissioned as a lieutenant and received his pilot wings in April of 1944. He flew many cross-country flights, was in many different states, piloted a B-24 bomber stateside, was a communication officer in the Army, and he was killed in January, January 27th of 1945, when his airplane crashed at Tyndall Field near Panama City, Florida. Ultimately, Harold was brought back here and buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery February 3rd of 1945. In his instance, his family chose to provide their own headstone. Dorsey and Harold being killed in stateside training accidents were among the first World War II fallen to be buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Others who were killed during the war overseas were initially interred overseas in temporary cemeteries, American cemeteries and faraway islands and the Pacific and forests in Europe until they were ultimately brought home between the years of 1947 and 1951. The next individuals we will be meeting here were individuals who paid the ultimate sacrifice, gave the ultimate sacrifice in the Pacific Theater during World War II, where there were 111,606 American combat deaths, 31,157 of whom were naval officers and enlisted men. Pictured here is an American cemetery on the island of Guadalcanal, where 80 years ago, American soldiers and Marines and sailors battled with the Japanese in the South Pacific. The first of these Pacific War casualties is Gettysburg native Lawrence Woodward. He was born here, September 17th of 1923. His parents were named Clarence and Jeanette. His dad worked as a plumber and Lawrence here, his nickname for his buddies at high school was Woody. He attended Gettysburg High School, much like many of these other young men we'll be meeting this evening. There he participated in the Drama Club, the Sportsman's Club, and the Chess Club, and he graduated in 1941. After high school, he got a job elsewhere in Pennsylvania with the Baldwin Locomotive Works. He married a young woman named Margaret in July of 1943. When he registered for selective service, he was 5 foot 11 inches tall, weighed 160 pounds, had blue eyes, blonde hair and a light complexion. Lawrence was drafted in 1943. He was eventually assigned to what is called the Americal Division, the 23rd Infantry Division, which was engaged in the Pacific and indeed had fought at Guadalcanal in 1942. By 1945, he was on the island of Leyte in the Philippines, where in February, he was severely wounded by Japanese fire. He suffered a broken right arm, wounds to his right side, and stomach and multiple shrapnel injuries. Lawrence lingered in the hospital for several months before succumbing to his wounds on April 15th of 1945. He was 22 years old. His death was announced in his hometown newspaper of the Gettysburg Times on May 7th of 1945. At the top of the paper, it was deemed the victory edition, announcing news of the German surrender in Europe the same day that the citizens of Gettysburg were still hearing about fallen soldiers from their hometown. Another story from the Philippines is Sergeant Eritas Worthington. He moved to Gettysburg. His family moved here by 1930. He was part of a large family, the oldest of eight children in the Worthington family. Eritas actually served in the US Army prior to World War II. He initially enlisted in 1934, and he served in, for seven years, mostly in Hawaii. 
He joined up again after the U.S. became involved in the Second World War. He enlisted in the fall of 1943, went back in. At this point, he was married. His wife's name was Helen. During the service, he took part in fighting in the New Guinea campaign. And in April of 1945, he actually drowned in the Philippines. That is how he met his end while serving his country. Eratus was brought back here and interred in Gettysburg in September of 1948. And today his headstone and his grave is right alongside his wife, Helen's. She passed in October of 1977. They, just like Lawrence, are buried in section three of Gettysburg National Cemetery. Our next fallen service member is Lieutenant Junior Grave Delbert Gideon. Delbert is something of a classic American story in that he was from all over, but still somehow called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania home. He was born in Indiana, raised in Oklahoma, and yet somehow married a Gettysburg native. When he was in Oklahoma, he went to high school there. He attended the University of Oklahoma, and he joined the Navy in 1927. Uh, Delbert was born in 1905. He joined the Navy in 1927. He served in the Pacific Theater for several years, and then he was stationed in Washington, D.C., where he met a young woman named Sarah Black. She was serving in the Women's Reserve of the United States Navy. She was discharged in 1943. At that point in time, he and Sarah were married. Uh, they were trying to have a child. Now, Delbert was killed in a plane crash on July 31st of 1944 near some islands off the coast of Australia. There were 19 aboard the plane including a rear admiral, Charles P. Cecil, who was himself buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Delbert was brought back here for his burial in Gettysburg in October of 1947. I should note when he was killed in the Pacific in his plane crash, he had a son who was eight months old. Delbert was interred in Gettysburg National Cemetery on November 1st of 1947. Now his wife, Sarah Catherine Black Gideon, she lived at 401 Baltimore Street, which is today right about where the Farnsworth House is in town. She's the daughter of George Black, who was the Gettysburg Postmaster at the time. Sarah was a 1927 graduate of Gettysburg College, member of the Chi Omega sorority. She received her degree, a doctorate degree from Penn State University. She was a working psychologist for many years. She passed away in 1988 and is buried in the Evergreen Cemetery on the same hillside as Delbert. Their son, George, he passed away in 2002 and is buried in Evergreen as well. So the family is all interred on the same hillside today. Another Gettysburg High School story, Sterrett Addison Dorsey. He was born in 1926 here in Gettysburg. He was in the Gettysburg High School class of 1946. He was a star athlete and football player, very popular with his classmates. One of his classmates, Milton Moyer, said the, this of, of Sterrett. He was a very pleasant and unassuming young man. He was a very nice person, and for all his athletic ability, he was very modest about it. His nickname was Duke. He lived with his family on Breckenridge Street in Gettysburg, and he left high school early to enlist in the Navy in 1944. He figured he'd get drafted at some point, so he wanted to enlist. He was five foot nine inches tall, weighed 170 pounds, had brown eyes and brown hair. Ultimately, Sterrett served on the USS Bridge, and it was tragically there on December 3rd of 1945 off the coast of Japan, where he suffered an accident aboard and died while serving overseas. Sterrett here was interred in Gettysburg National Cemetery January 7th of 1948. Now included in these stories from the Pacific Theater are two stories relating to Gettysburg College. I think there's a great number of individuals who have attended Gettysburg College through the years who maybe don't end up living in Gettysburg, but still think of Gettysburg as home for that reason. There are three, uh, so there were 64 alumni from Gettysburg College who died in the war. Three of them are buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery, including Lieutenant, Lieutenant Robert R. Love and Captain James A. Thompson. Thompson was a native of uh, Westmoreland County, PA. He graduated Gettysburg College with the class of 1940, where he was in the Sigma Chi fraternity there. Uh, James Thompson here served in India as an executive officer in an army post, Barakpol, India, where he was flying the hump over the Himalayan mountains 
And it was on a, one of those flights that he was killed in a crash November 9th of 1944. Just two headstones down is the grave of Robert Love. Robert was in the Gettysburg College class of 1942. He left early to enlist and serve in the Army Air Forces. He had enlisted in 1941. Robert was five foot eight inches tall, weighed 152 pounds, had blue eyes, blonde hair, and a ruddy complexion. And Robert was a second lieutenant in the Army Air Force. He was assigned to the 36th Pursuit Squadron, 8th per Pursuit Group, 5th Air Force. And it was on May 1st of 1942 that he was killed in a plane crash on the coast of Australia. He too was buried here in 1948. The remainder of the stories we have this evening are from the European theater of World War II. This was the costliest portion of the war for the United States. In just the final 11 months alone in Western Europe, Americans lost 587,000 casualties, 78% of Allied losses in that time span. In just Western Europe, there were 135,576 American dead during World War II, not even counting North Africa, Sicily, Italy, almost half of the total US dead worldwide. The first of these individuals, I should note, we're looking at here at an image of the, again, the Henri Chapelle US military cemetery in Belgium. Next, we will meet Orby McMillian. He also was not born here in Gettysburg. He was born in West Virginia, but he moved here with his family in the early 1930s. And he ultimately lived here for 13 years before his death. Orby was married when he served. His wife was named Corrine. They were married March 26 of 1938 in West, Westminster, Maryland. They lived here in the town where Orby worked in a furniture factory and his wife worked as an operating sewing machine in a silk mill. When Orby registered for selective service, he was 27 years old, stood five foot eight inches tall and weighed 114 pounds. He entered the US Armed Forces May 4th of 1943. And he ultimately served in the 45th Infantry Division. Later that year, he went to North Africa. He went to Italy in 1944. And it was there that he took part in the Anzio campaign. His last letter home was dated February 5th of 1944. And it was on the 18th of February when his division was hit by German mechanized divisions outside of Anzio, where the German assault nearly broke through the Allied lines. Orby's regiment, the 179th Infantry, was hit hard. He was fatally wounded that day. Initially, he was listed as missing in action in a telegram that his wife received in April of 1944. Ultimately, in July, they received word here in Gettysburg that Orby had been killed in action. His wife lived on South Washington Street in the town. Orby was brought back here for his final burial in Section 3 of Gettysburg National Cemetery. And today, his wife, she passed away in 1996. Korean, she rests by his side, together again in their hometown. Maurice Small was the eldest of 17 children born to Augustus and Ada Grace Small here in Adams County, Pennsylvania. His, his father, Walter Augustus, worked as a pressman and printer for the Gettysburg Times. And as a young boy, much like many of his brothers, Maurice worked as a carrier boy for the Gettysburg Times. He went to St. Francis Xavier Parochial School. And in 1936, he married Mar Martha Emma Miller. They had no children together. Now, Maurice was old for a World War II soldier. He was born in 1906. He registered for the Selective Service. He was five foot six, weighed 125 pounds, had blue eyes, brown hair, and a light complexion. And he was drafted in November of 1943 went and trained at Fort McClellan in Alabama. And ultimately he served and was assigned to Company C of the 116th Infantry Regiment, 29th Infantry Division. Now this regiment was hitting the shores of Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944. Maurice was not with the regiment that day. He arrived overseas in France on July 5th of 1944, about one month later. And it was shortly after then, on July 13th, that he was killed outside of St. Lowe. 
His wife received a telegram from the War Department on August 9th informing her that Maurice was missing, missing in action, and a few days later she was informed he had indeed been killed. She lived in Hanover, Pennsylvania at the time. Three days before his death, Maurice had written a letter home to his father telling him this, in the event something should happen to me, please see that Tub and Chet, his younger brothers, Thomas and Chester, both get a good education. And if Mart, his wife Martha, should need anything, please give her a helping hand. Maurice was buried here in Gettysburg National Cemetery in 1948. He was older for a World War II soldier. He was 38, and that's what his brother Chester noted in an interview and in quotes he gave to the Gettysburg Times. Chester himself was 15 when he learned of Maurice's death. He himself would go to serve in the Marines, and he enlisted in 1945 at the age of 16. Chester passed away in 2010, but Chester Small had a large impact on our community and many, many knew him quite well. Our next individual is the third Gettysburg College alum to be killed in action in World War II and buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Ralph Logan Staley. His story is uh, a story of hard work and dedication and it reminds us yet again that home can be many different things. Ralph was from Altoona, Pennsylvania. His dad died when he was a young man. He was a devoted member of his local Lutheran church, and he was a brilliant student, so much so that he graduated high school at the age of 16, and he began his undergraduate education at Gettysburg College in 1938. And you name it, he did it at Gettysburg College. Uh, you can see his yearbook photo there, there's a lot of stuff underneath his name on that yearbook photo, a lot of different accolades and things he participated in. He was an editor for the campus newspaper and yearbook, a member of the student senate. He was a national honor society for journalism, German, education, and history. He was on the Dean's Scholastic Honors List every single semester, an avid student of history. He no doubt at one point spent time walking through Gettysburg National Cemetery where he's now buried. Staley graduated in January of 1943, and he, and he went right into training to be an officer in the U.S. Army, because he had been in the Campus Reserve Corps when he was here in Gettysburg. He trained at Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. By April of 1944, he departed for France as a second lieutenant with the 119th Infantry Regiment, 30th Infantry Division. The 30th Division arrived in France after D-Day on Omaha Beach, and they were very much involved in the fight to break out of Normandy. On August 21st, Second Lieutenant Ralph Staley was killed in action outside of Morton. He was 22 years old. His last letter home had arrived just three days prior on August 18th, but his mom didn't worry too much about him, not hearing much from him, because about a week later on the 25th, some flowers arrived for her. Ralph had been killed on the 21st, but he saw to it before he died that he had flowers sent to his mother for her birthday, which was August 25th of 1944. So four days after her son's death in battle, his mother, Florence Staley, received flowers from her son, not knowing he had just been killed. It was September 11th of 1944 that Florence received word that Ralph had been killed in action. He was initially buried overseas, but April 21st, 1949, he was interred here at Gettysburg National Cemetery. Presiding over his funeral was the Reverend Dr. Henry Hansen, the president of Gettysburg College. Our next story is that of Robert Staub, a Hanover native. He was born to Ellis Eugene and Louise Rebecca Staub, originally from Hanover, Pennsylvania. His father, Ellis, was a woodworker at a local cabinet factory, but he was also himself a World War I veteran. He had been wounded at Chateau Thierry on the Western Front in July of 1918, serving with Company D, Company D of the 7th United States Infantry Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division. Robert was their eldest son out of five children. Robert worked locally, was involved in local churches in Hanover and New Oxford. When he registered for the Selective Service, Robert was five foot six, weighed 130 pounds, had brown eyes, brown hair, and a light complexion. He enlisted on July 1st of 1942 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. 
He ultimately served in Company I of the 318th Infantry Regiment, 30th Infantry Division. And he was killed in action in France on November 16th of 1944 and ultimately brought back home for burial in Gettysburg, June 29th of 1949. And I think Robert's story is so poignant for several different reasons, one of which being in 1918, his dad, Ellis Eugene, fought in France in the war that was supposed to end all wars. He was wounded fighting for his country in France, only to see over tw 20 years later, his son go back fighting in France for the United States once again, with his son ultimately dying for his country. 20 years after Robert's death, his father Ellis died, and he too was buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. They're buried in different sections of the cemetery, but father and son united by service, both in life and in death. Our next story is that of Willard J. Bob Creighton. Bob was an Adams County native. He was uh, born in 1910, and his family lived in Carroll County, Maryland, at that point in time. So he was not born here in Adams County. His dad worked as a farmer. By 1930, Willard was 19, still living with his parents, and he was working at a shoe factory in Littlestown, Pennsylvania. He was married, his wife's name was Lillian. They were married in 1933. By 1940, he's still working in Littlestown in the leather department of the shoe factory where his wife worked as an office manager. Bob here was five foot nine inches tall, weighed 155 pounds, had gray eyes, brown hair, and a ruddy complexion. They lived on South Queen Street in Littlestown. Soon after registering for selective service, the Creighton's, uh, Creighton was transferred to the company's Harrisburg, Harrisonburg, Virginia plant. And it was there that he joined up. He was drafted into the army in December of 1943. And he went on to serve as a tech sergeant in the 79th Infantry Division. Hospital records show that Bob was wounded in the shoulder in November of 1944 by an artillery shell. Ultimately, he was killed December 16th of 1944 in France. He was brought back here and buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery, January 26th of 1949. The next day, Earl Swope was killed in action. Earl Swope was born in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, born March 14th of 1922. His dad, Earl Sr., passed away in 1936. The family remained in Gettysburg, where Earl, whose nickname was Beck, attended Gettysburg High School. After he graduated high school, he worked in several places nearby in, Lork, in, in York and Mechanicsburg. He was married. His wife's name was Pauline. They went by Beck and Polly. I should note these photographs are courtesy of Earl Swope's surviving family members. December 1st of 1942, Earl enlisted in the United States Army, and he was assigned to the newly forming 99th Infantry Division. He trained in many places stateside here in the US, and by the fall of 1944, they were embarking for the European Theater of Operations. Being a newer division, they were assigned towards a part of the line near Belgium, he was a squad leader in Company C of the 393rd Infantry Regiment. And they were stationed in these woods in the Ardennes Forest in December of 1944. And it was here on December 16th of 1944 that the Third Reich launched its last desperate offensive in the Western Front of World War II, trying to break through the Allied Front in Western Europe. This became the bloodiest battle in all of World War II for American forces, the Battle of the Bulge. One out of every 10 American casualties in the war fell in the Battle of the Bulge in December of 1944 and January of 1945. And on December 16th, Earl's regiment was in the front line in these woods. As the attack hit the men that morning, it was a massive assault. A member of Swope's squad recalled it as beginning early that morning with an unrelenting artillery fire. Quote, we knew the Germans had something in mind for us. Wave after wave of German troops were slamming into Swope and his men. The American line was eventually overrun. Afterwards, his comrade John Rarick noted, I looked out and could only see bodies, including the body of squad leader Earl Swope of Pennsylvania. 
After Earl's death, he was initially listed as missing in action. By March of 1945, however, a telegram arrived here in Gettysburg informing his family that he had been killed. While Earl was initially buried in the Henri Chapelle Cemetery in 1948, on April 21st, he was interred here in Gettysburg National Cemetery. This is a scanned copy of the Purple Heart given to Earl Swope posthumously. And this is Earl's headstone, his grave in section three of Gettysburg National Cemetery. Our next story takes us to March of 1945 in Germany itself. Sergeant Hobart Sterner, whose parents were Willis and Pauline Sterner. His mother died when Hobart was four. The family was from Littlestown, Pennsylvania. By 1930, Hobart was listed as living with his grandfather. By 1940, he was living with an older brother. <clears throat> he was married as well. His wife's name was Frances. They were married July of 1942. The couple, after being married, lived here in Gettysburg on Baltimore Street. Hobart worked locally in Biglerville. He was a member of the Benders Lutheran Church. And he was drafted into the United States Army on December 1st of 1942. Hobart was five foot nine, weighed 185 pounds, had gray eyes, brown hair, and a ruddy complexion. By the fall of 1944, he was overseas and he was serving in the same division as Staff Sergeant Earl Swope, the 99th Infantry Division. Hobart here served in the, 300 and the 395th Infantry Regiment. And he was killed in action five miles outside of Cologne, Germany, March 2nd of 1945. One of his sisters received a telegram from the War Department which informed her of Hobart's death, and it included these lines. The forthcoming freedom of the oppressed peoples and an eternal peace will be a lasting tribute to your brother and to those comrades who have given their lives in this conflict. Hobart was buried here in Gettysburg National Cemetery, November 22nd, 1947. These are the names of Adams County natives killed in action or dying of their service in World War II who are buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Not all were born here, but all called this county home, the same county so many of us love and cherish, the same county this wonderful historical society is dedicated to preserving its rich history and telling its story, a county we're all honored to be a part of. But it's worth noting that not all came home. There are still thousands of fallen Americans buried across the world. And it is the American Battle Monuments Commission that is given the solemn task of preserving these burial sites across the globe. There are 207,000 World War I and World War II fallen commemorated by the American Battle Monuments Commission. For World War I fallen, 31,000 graves, 4,400 memorialized and memorial walls. For World War II fallen, 93,000 graves across the globe, 79,000 names memorialized. In the words of General John J. Pershing, time will not dim the glory of their deeds. We see here the Normandy American Cemetery. One Dwight Eisenhower knew very well. And in the interest of sharing some of these stories, I'd like to highlight just one of them this evening. And that is of another Adams County native, Horace Bushman. Horace was born here in 1916. His parents were Rufus and Hattie Bushman. He was very much involved in his local community, went to Gettysburg High School where he graduated in 1935. There he played varsity football, basketball, and baseball. He was an all-American kid. He worked as a pressman for the Gettysburg Times, was a member of the Gettysburg Fire Company. His wife was named Marion. They were married March of 1942. And Horace here was drafted October of that year. And he was assigned to Battery A of the 310th Field Artillery Battalion, 79th Infantry Division. After training stateside by the spring of 1944, he was shipped overseas to be part of the Great Crusade that Dwight Eisenhower led. He arrived in France on Utah Beach on June 14th of 1944. It was on June 25th that Horace was riding in a Jeep near an observation post when a German artillery shell struck a nearby tree and killed him. He was 27 years old. One month later, when news arrived here in Gettysburg of Horace's death, the Gettysburg Times rushed into print, had a story of his death on the front page. He was not brought home. Horace 
His home now is the Normandy American Cemetery in France, where he is still interred and buried at the American Cemetery at Colville-sur-Mer, St. Laurent on the Sea, overlooking the bluffs and sands of Omaha Beach, with the waters of the English Channel providing a constant hum below. He's in plot E, row 24, grave 28. On August 29th, over 250 people gathered at the Gettysburg Presbyterian Church on Baltimore Street to honor Horace Bushman. That day, Reverend Robert Hunt spoke, reminding the mourners of what Horace had, Horace had fought for. He said this, Horace Bushman gave his life for you and for a world of free men in service of God and country. He said, Horace Bushman, together with a great many comrades, went forth in a great crusade and pledged his life to liberate the enslaved, to overcome the world of force and oppression in order that men might once more live in freedom upon the earth. He was victorious in this crusade for by the grace of God, he saw men and women and little children freed from the tyrant's yoke. He helped drive fear from the faces of people like ourselves and to see it replaced with joy, confidence, and a new hope. Horace is with thousands of his brothers in arms. Their home now is Normandy. But in life, it was counties all across the United States. All of the headstones in the Normandy American Cemetery are oriented, facing to the west, so that these headstones are looking out across the waters of the English Channel and looking back towards the United States. Even in death, these young men are still looking home. Home can be many different things. It is something that motivates us. It is something that shapes us. It is something that we seek. It is what brought Dwight Eisenhower here to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, when he bought this farm that is now Eisenhower National Historic Site. So many of these young men who never got to come home in life, some got to come home uh, after their death and their sacrifices. But th these sacrifices that they made in their life were motivated by that idea of home. And the great crusade that Dwight Eisenhower spoke of in his D-Day Order of the Day, talking about preserving freedom and liberating millions from tyranny. It's the same spirit, the same crusade that Lincoln spoke about here at Gettysburg in the Gettysburg Address in November of 1863, when President Lincoln reminded us, looking out upon the graves of fallen United States soldiers, that there was still a great task remaining before us. So whether it's here at Gettysburg in 1863, whether it's the 69th Pennsylvania holding the line on Cemetery Ridge on July 3rd, or whether it's Horace Bushman leaving that same hometown where these Pennsylvanians held the line to go and fight for a great crusade years later, home is a shared constant through the years. It's one thing we can all relate to and understand. And I wanna share one last story with you as we wrap up our program here tonight. One more story of an Adams County native buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. It's a Tech 5 Tech Sergeant Lowell, Lowell F. Clark. Lowell was born in Indiana and he moved to Adams County. He was born in May of 1917. He had a grammar school education and he worked as a furniture manufacturer in Littlestown, Pennsylvania. By 1940, Lowell's parents had died and he was living with his sister, Thelma, her husband, and their, uh, their children. He was living with his sister, who was six years older than he, raising her younger brother. He joined the U.S. Army February 9th of 1942. He served in the field artillery of the 3rd Armored Division under the command of General George S. Patton. He was five foot, ten and a half inches tall, weighed 128 pounds, had blue eyes, brown hair, and a light complexion. You can see him pictured there on screen. Before he went overseas, Lowell got married. His wife was named Anna. She also was from Indiana. And they had a young son named Thomas Francis Clark, who was born May 18th of 1944. Pictured here is Lowell's junior high school class photo. He is highlighted in yellow. Lowell Clark was killed in action October 3rd of 1944. He was brought back here for burial in Gettysburg in his home county, December 15th of 1947. 
For several years after his death, Lowell's sister Thelma published memorial poems for him in his honor in the Hanover Evening Sun. These are poems written by a mourning sister who had lost her parents, took in her brother, only to see him lost as well. During the Second World War, during all times of conflict, there's, there's so many families who have loved ones who serve, who hang a blue star in the window. For those who have fallen, that star of blue turns to gold. And I'd like to share here just two of the poems written about Lowell by his sister Thelma as we close our program. He, she wrote this in 1946. He went one day with a cheery wave, a gay farewell and a smile he gave. And he went with a purpose true and the window was hung a star of blue. He did the task that was given him to help rid the world of greed and sin. He fought a good fight, so the message told, but the star of blue has turned to gold. Dear Father, be near those homes we pray where the message has come or will someday. Comfort each heart with love so true where a gold star hangs in place of blue. One year later, she noted, when evening shadows fall and we are sitting all alone, in my heart there comes a longing, if only you could come home. Oft and oft my thoughts do wander to your grave so far away, where they laid you, dearest brother, three years ago today. Lowell Clark would eventually fulfill his sister's wish and come home. As we close, these are the names and grave locations of the individuals we have discussed this evening, their burial locations in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Thank you all for joining us for this virtual program. Thank you to Antigone and the Adams County Historical Society for your efforts in preserving the history, the rich history of this county we all love and call home, and for giving me an opportunity to share some of these stories with you this evening as we remember those who, service, who served our country during the Second World War. Thank you, Dan. That was a very moving tribute to the veterans. And I know that you are very deeply involved in the World War II weekend, which is coming up a week from today or a week from tomorrow. Could you tell us a little bit about the World War II weekend and also about the cemetery tours so that uh, people will know that they can come and have a tour of these grave sites. Yes, Eisenhower National Historic Site does a lot of programming to commemorate the Second World War, not just discussing Dwight Eisenhower himself and his role in it, but acknowledging the role that the Second World War had in shaping the history of the United States. Uh, our September 2022 event, which begins a week from tomorrow on September 16th, is focused on the year of 1942 and talking about the events of 80 years ago. So we'll have great programming. Uh, the Eisenhower's granddaughter, Susan, will be our keynote program speaker on Friday evening, September 16th. All our programming details and our schedule of speakers is listed on our park website, which is NPS, as in National Park Service, nps.gov slash E-I-S-E. We have a full schedule there. And stay tuned to our website as we post updates about our programming throughout the year. We have many virtual programs. We have a whole web page on our, on our website of video profiles of fallen World War II service members who are buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Uh, we offer World War II walking tours throughout the year. All those are, are posted on our website when they are happening. So uh, we interpret many different parts of Dwight Eisenhower's life. We talk about his presidency, his retirement years here at his Gettysburg farm. And we use our special events, such as our annual September World War II weekend event, to talk about the impact of the Second World War on the life of Dwight Eisenhower and the life of our country and the impact it had on the world. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great event, has a large living history camp, lots of great speakers. Uh, we're looking forward to it and encourage you all to find your way to interact with the history of the Second World War in your hometown, your home counties, and remember the sacrifices of so many who fought 80 years ago. And you're going to have some veterans there this year again? Yes, yes. We are planning on having some veterans with us uh, for a special program on Saturday, September 17th. All right. 
Well, I encourage everyone to check out the schedule and join us. I'm going to be there for sure. And Dan, thank you for a program this evening. This was wonderful. I very much appreciate your time and the amount of research you did to get this information. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good night.